Hi, welcome to Susu number eight. I can't believe it's number eight already. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're new to Susu, Susu is the local jam that could start it off as a way for us to get together in COVID around music in a safe way. And then it became about um, creating a space where we could bring different people together and see what happened, but creating the kind of environment where no matter who you were, you can step in and maybe find someone who, you know, reflects who you are. So that's what Susu's about. Um, it's also uh, from a tradition from uh, my upbringing, from my Grenadian mother, who upon coming to Canada with her whole heap of sisters, um, didn't really have much money, but had big dreams. And so one way that they could fill that gap was they put together Uh, what was called an actual susu. And that was each of the 12 sisters would save a little bit of money until the pot got bigger. And then they'd rotate that pot around until everybody got their their fair share. So in that spirit of putting together our local bits to to come up with something bigger that we can share with each other, that's what susu is. But we actually collect um, a real susu for members of, of the community. Um, who might need a little bit of a, a bit of a boost. Uh, Lydia, you want to chat with folks about um, how they can help with the actual SUSU? Yeah, we uh, recently introduced the option of um, donating via e-transfer. So you can send your e-transfers to uh, SUSU Music Series at gmail.com. We're going to have Luca in the chat share that link for you. We also have um, accessibility to donate through PayPal as well. And that link will be included. And um, when, when the concept of SUSU was presented to the group um, by Alana, uh, we were very adamant to make sure that money was given back to our community, the community that we benefit from and the community that we involve ourselves in. So when I say benefit from, I think of um, all the different types of neighbor- neighborhoods and businesses and social justice programs that exist to support one another within the different systems that we function in. So we try and find more direct and personal ways to donate the mm-hmm. SUSU donations um, to the community. Um, some of those organizations have been ESN. They have been um, towards Little Jamaica and saving the businesses up on Eglinton. Um, and also to personal community members who are in need. Um, I'm loving the fact that folks are just fully asking for help via, um, via PayPal or, or um, Venmo or in, um, in programs that raise money um, for very personal needs, for rent for groceries, for childcare, um, for very real needs that are being affected within COVID. So we're always looking out to help people. If you know of anybody who needs help, please reach out to us at susumusicseries at gmail.com. And we are very, very open to helping those, to helping those in need. Uh, no questions asked. We all need help and we all want that door open policy to ask for it. Um, let's breed that culture Uh, a bit more together. So are we ready to do our land acknowledgements? I think that's a a very key component of of making sure that we're checking for our community. Totally. And speaking of being, you know, in the skin that I'm in, in in the land that I'm on. And so we right now, before we get into uh, our land acknowledgement, Take a moment to consider ourselves on this land, in the room that we're in, on the street that we live on, in the room that we occupy, and um, recognize that we are on Turtle Island in Ticoronto. That's where at least we are. Uh, If you're viewing from another place, um, we highly encourage you to figure out um, the indigenous land that place um, occupies because uh, this is a history that we're working with and that has been hidden from us for far too long. So uh, in regards to Ticoronto, uh, we acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now the home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. Um, I would like to share in all of us committing to learning more and doing better 
and sharing and raising the narratives of indigenous people around us. Um, I really and truly believe that um, if we try and address issues such as the climate crisis, the homeless crisis, racism, mm -hmm. the healthcare crisis during COVID, missing and murdered indigenous women, girls and two-spirited folks, colonialism, capitalism, and pu the pipeline production across this, um, this continent, and we exclude the narratives and recognition of indigenous voices, we are missing a very key part of these conversations. And so, especially I think in the climate crisis, it's very easy for us to um, disconnect from the indigenous narratives of um, literally the, uh, gate, the um, custodians of this land mm. um, as we occupy their land as settlers. And, um, you know, we, we carry a lot of that weight in the lack of history that we've been taught um, over the years. I know that uh, the public school system has done us a massive disservice but we're here today to hold the government accountable. And so we encourage you to reach out to your government officials to ask for better and more education on indigeneity and the history of um, this place we call Canada, Turtle Island and Toronto specifically. So um, yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, it, it's always, um, whenever uh, we do the land acknowledgement, I think about the start of Susu and how uh, and make that ground that history in the present day possibilities that we get to enjoy because um, people care for the land and then graciously shared it with us. Susie started off in, in parks and just sitting on the grass amongst the trees. The fact that, it, that they are still alive and, and well for us to enjoy. There were people here before us that that made that possible. And so that's part of, you know, I think the land acknowledgement doesn't just end at the beginning of an event, but that awareness and that appreciation um, can come up in, in the small moments of, of joy that we get to enjoy in, in, in the city that we live in. Um, and I'm always curious about what happens when um, indigenous identity and experiences, how they parallel with uh, black experiences, not comparing them or putting them against each other, but understanding um, uh, what are the similarities, what are the differences and the nuances of experiences between them. And that's why I'm excited about today's conversation is because we are speaking with um, some of the most highly celebrated voices and artists in contemporary Canadian music. <clears throat> and they happen to be black and indigenous and queer um, and, but they, they, they create music within the classical music or they extend from the classical music um, history as we know it, the Western classical music history. And so today's conversation, we get to hear, okay, well, what, what do those intersections feel like and how do they contribute to the sounds that we, um, we listen to over breakfast or we play during date night, you know, and like what was the path in between those experiences? Um, so for those of you who are just joining us, we are Susu where we bring together music and conversation to hear from the artists that we love to get to know more about their life experiences, but what their life experiences can highlight in our own personal um, life experiences. And today we hear from Jeremy Dutcher, uh, Khadija Mbao, Beverly Glenn Copeland. Um, something that I feel uh, I don't hear enough of personally is um, when the indigenous experience connects or intersects with the black experience and um, how queer identity can, uh, uh, can impact um, the relationship between those different, like there's just so much nuance that happens when um, different ident identities intersect. And then you take those identities that are already marginalized by society, and then you place them in classical music, which I don't know what, like I think about classical music and I think about like Figaro when I think about opera. I don't know that much about classical music except for the, the stereotypical idea of it. Um, and the reason why I bring it up is because we have a conversation where we get to hear from 
Black, Indigenous, queer voices in the context of a music that is historically very like white and elitist and of a certain age group. And here you have different ages and different identities um, that emerged from that, from that scene. I'm personally very excited to learn. I'm personally very excited to hear from some of the most celebrated voices and emerging voices in contemporary Canadian music. Um, and we're gonna hear from them directly where they'll detail the uh, experiences um, of those intersections within classical music canon. Mm -hmm. So Susu will bring you music and conversation, but it feels like music is the best way to kick things off. So one of those artists uh, is gonna, well, what, what, what are they gonna do, Lydia? And who are they? Well, Khadija Mbao uh, goes by the cool, fun, millennial auntie in their social commentary content videos on YouTube. Um, Khadija Mbao is a opera singer, classical music, and a social commentary activist. Um, they, them, have studied at UFT for the opera program there, getting their bachelor's degree in opera and classical music. And uh, they also engage in unbelievable social commentary content that has to do with everything going on in the world right now. Um, they have a really amazing video that talks about the show Bridgerton and some of the issues surrounding colorism and queer baiting. I had not heard of that term before, queer baiting, which is when you think something is gonna be queer and they frame it as such, but it's not. <laughs> and I think that, um, I think that it, it's, it's a really interesting take on, on how marketing um, it has a massive influence on the way we address representation, true representation and um, inclusivity, the celebration of, um, of diversity. So uh, they have so many amazing videos discussing queerness, social events, racism, I mentioned, and I mentioned colorism and so much more. And their voice is just, just luxury. Like when I hear Khadija, I'm like, this is the voice of luxury. Um, so, uh, I'm so happy to introduce Khadija Mbo to the Susu family and to the Susu community. And so here they are performing some amazing classical pieces that I won't even try to pronounce. Take it away, Khadija. Hello, my name is Khadija Mbo. I'm a classically trained operatic soprano. And today I just want to sing some weird songs for y'all. <laughs> They're not going to be that weird. The first one is, but the rest of them will be pretty normal. So the first piece I'm going to sing for you is called Der Erlkönig, which means the Elf King in German. And this is a piece by Franz Schubert. He is a very famous classical pianist and composer and is best known for dying at the tender age of 30 something of syphilis. Yeah. Anyway, in this piece, I'm gonna be playing four different characters. And uh, yeah, typically I don't use music when I'm singing, but this one is a bit involved. So <laughs> we're gonna see. This is basically about a father and a son riding home in the night and the son is sick and he's seeing this elf king and he's trying to tell his dad but his dad can't see it and the elf king is talking to him so there's the narrator the father the son and the elf king and i get to do all four characters and it's a good time so uh yeah <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
actually won a Nobel Prize for this piece of music. I would encourage y'all to listen to the full cycle on YouTube because it's with orchestra and that's how you should really hear it. This is going to be with piano and it's fine but it doesn't do it justice is all I'm saying. The intro was quite long too so just bear with me. I promise I will start singing eventually. <laughs> Thank you. 
I, I would never associate that singing with piercings and leather. I just wouldn't. <laughs> I don't. So I mean, they are a rebel. They are a rebel through and through. They are here to break down barriers. They are here to build their own identity as a Black queer opera singer. And, and we are here for it because... Mm -hmm. It is, opera is so inaccessible in so many ways. Um, the stories, the, the theater, uh, you know, the, the, the theater shows that they come from, the segments and the songs and the selections, there's so much context around it. It's like taking Shakespeare and reading a couple lines and, and trying to understand, you know, what the context was with the love triangles and the identity fraud and the blah, blah, blah. And Khadija just really brings it home in such a light, uh, graceful way that feels, um, you know, tangible to understand for opera, which I don't think a lot of us can really can really say. Mm -hmm. so thank you, Khadija, for that amazing, powerful performance that's just both, you know, as I said, luxurious in its sound and style, but so playful and so light in, in the delivery and, uh, and the setup. Beautiful. It does make it does make opera feel accessible. You know, we don't have to have a certain um, background or foundational understanding of what the music is. You can feel it and feel the impact of it, and it and it resonates. But also, seeing a black woman with three nose piercings and a crop leather vest, just like oh, maybe I could fit in the operatic the operatic space. So that was Kandija and Bao. Uh, U of T trained classical opera uh, singer and also uh, an inclusion and equity advocate for uh, different voices within uh, classical music institutions. And I think it's fair to say that when we think about classical music, we think old, white, rich. It's just this, there's this cliche of what classical music um, is and even participating in it um, as a new artist, there's still uh, an institutional, like academic, you go to university and you study quote unquote, real music or serious music. That's always been the perception of classical music that I've held in my mind that I think is pretty, is a pretty common understanding uh, amongst um, most people. Mm -hmm. But seeing Khadija versus hearing them, um, and thank you for introducing Susu to Khadija's um, practice. Uh, got me thinking about what else are we misunderstanding about uh, classical music? What other voices are there that we may not associate with classical music based on that understanding of old, white, rich? Um, totally. And even, I think I need a musical education. If that is my understanding of classical music, then maybe I need to, to um, rethink what classical music is. And that's what the conversation we're having today hopefully will do is um, shift our perspective on who gets to compose, perform, present um, classical music, and even uh, reshape our thinking of what classical music is. So we got Khadija, who everybody just saw is big time powerhouse, luxurious as Lydia says. <laughs> and uh, we got two other equally powerful musicians, not just in music, but in spirit, in laughter, just heartwarming, talented, uh, grounding presence in music. Uh, we reached out to the one and only Beverly Glenn Copeland and Jeremy Dutcher, 
uh, who joined Khadija, Lydia and I in conversation about this very thing. Presence, sounds, um, and identities that contradict the stereotype of the old rich white classical music patron. Um, and recognizing that that is the, the commonly held perception of, of this genre, we wanted to hear, well, what were some of the experiences, uh, what were their experiences like contending with that understanding, um, being trained at a university level in classical music, being black, being in indigenous, being queer, um, but also what inspired them to dip into, I mean, what teenagers like, I would like to sing opera and not be like a pop star, you know, what, what um, ushered them into that musical world and what kept them in it as well? What, what motivates them to maintain a strong and unique presence in classical music? All of that is coming up in the conversation, but if you're just joining us, a couple of things that you should know. One, this is Susu. And you're welcome here. Everyone is is welcome because this is this is the the jam that invites different people to come together and see what can happen. <clears throat> Excuse me. And some of the voices that we brought together today: Khadija Mbal, who is a U of T trained opera singer and an inclusion and equity advocate, uh, uh, promoting um, new voices in classical music. I was joined by Glever Gleverly Ben Copeland. <laughs> Beverly, ben, Beverly Glenn Copeland, a 77 year old uh, composer and opera trained artist who has had a revival. I don't like to call Glenn a late bloomer. I just like to think that uh, he's been simmering this whole time or marinating this whole time. And we just get to now have a juicy taste of this incredible musicianship mm -hmm. and an impeccable uh, spirit and generous heart. Uh, Beverly Glenn is 77 years young, and it was only about maybe three or four years ago that uh, a Japanese record collector happened upon his recordings from the 1970s, and now uh, his music uh, is being celebrated by uh, pop artists like Robin and Caribou, but also um, being featured in publications like the New York Times and the New Yorker who want to know the person behind this impeccable sound. Uh, and maybe we'll, we'll play a little bit of snippet, a, a little snippet of his music and you'll get to know the person that we've come to love. And Glenn also is joined by Jeremy Dutcher, who is a Polaris Prize and Juno Prize, Juno Award winning, classically trained indigenous tenor and composer and musicologist. Um, and Jeremy won the Polaris Prize for his uh, 2018 album, Wallistawig Lintua Gunua, um, which puts at the forefront his uh, indigenous uh, language, classical music presented through an indigenous language of his people, the Wallistawigs, I believe, from New Brunswick. Um, and you know what's great about the three of them? What I love about them, Lydia, is just they've got the greatest laughs, you know, for all of the, um, I'm sure, uh, work that they had to do to present new um, new sounds in, in such an entrenched system. <clears throat> Excuse me, man, the joy emanating from these three and the smiles that showed up in the conversation is just so heartwarming. Um, mm -hmm. So enough. Enough chat from, from us. Here's a conversation between Khadija Mbal, Beverly Glenn Copeland, Jeremy Dutch, and ourselves talking about classical music. What is that anyway? Question mark. <laughs> Hi. Khadija. Hello. Yay. Wow. <laughs> I feel emotional. Oh, so excited and nervous at the same time. I'm oh. blushing. Nervous, nervous. Yeah, I feel like I want to do right by this conversation. This I you that we were said. I've been asking you during the break. I'm oh. <laughs> Is that Sharon Osbourne? <laughs> That's so funny. It's literally Sharon Osbourne. I'm sorry about that. Very <laughs> now, in defense of Sharon Osbourne, I was I was checking out um, your links and your YouTube link, 
Um, oh, it plays it automatically. Yeah, it haunts me too sometimes. Sometimes I'll just be like doing my own thing and I'll just hear. Yeah, I get it. I totally get it. <laughs> we did not invite Sharon Osborne to this conversation, <laughs> but um, she should be so lucky. What? I mean, I think Sharon Osborne needs to witness this, this conversation. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> um, I guess we should, I want to introduce everybody to everybody else now that we have faces on screens. Mm -hmm. um, Glenn, this is Khadija and Jeremy. Khadija, Glenn and Jeremy and Jeremy, Khadija and Glenn. And I'm Lydia and... I'm Elena. Um, so to again, anchor... To anchor the convo, we're talking to three classically, classical music uh, trained artists um, whose experiences or identities, at least on the surface, may seem incongruous with a common perception or misconception of, of classical music. So we can get into the nuances of that um, throughout the convo, but wanted to anchor um, what what is this common understanding of classical music. And Khadija, I wanted to start with you because um, you as a as an opera singer, uh, I think that your your musical output probably aligns the most with how we understand classical music. So how would you how would you describe in layman's terms to someone who's maybe never heard of classical music or encountered classical music culture? Um, how would you describe it? At its best? Classical music is a, 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 a subtle yet visceral reflection of, of our society, of a composer's mindset, of, of music at its, its most collaborative and intense and also mm. most, like, I, I don't know a word for that. You know, language sometimes doesn't do justice, but... Uh, and at its worst, it is a very antiquated and elitist genre of music that is is going to take some time to uh, sort out. Mm. <laughs> That's how I describe it. <laughs> and I think it's that latter description that stuck in the minds of most people of it being very, well, how I'm dressed today, like frills, buttoned up. <laughs> And even even formulaic in many ways in, in its composition and the settings that it's presented in, um, uh, even based on ticket price, it seems like an elitist, maybe kind of exclusive kind of music. But then when I'm looking at the three of you and reflecting on what I know of your of your sounds, um, y'all ain't stuffy, y'all ain't stuffy at all. So I'm curious to know. Um, Jeremy, I feel like in your bio, you actually explicitly um, counter this common understanding of the stuffy classical music and you describe your sound as, as post-classical. What does that actually, what does that actually mean in practice? That, oh my gosh, I think somebody wrote that. I don't know if I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> I should look into that. Post-classical, I don't know what that means. Well, you know what, I think what I will say is, I think it, we're coming to a time right now where we're deconstructing even what that term means, right? Classic mm -hmm. music, like who's, who's classic, right? Every mm -hmm. culture has a classic, you know? Uh, I, look at, I look at, you know, the, the lineage and, and history of elliptic songs, you know, in, in my heritage where we come from and the, you know, the classics that exist among our nation. You know, and this doesn't get lifted up in, in, in what gets called classical music, you know, and I think there's lots of artists now that are hoping to change this, you know, and bringing our, uh, what we know to be just as uh, rigorous uh, of, of, of musical uh, education and, and mentorship, and it's all part of it, right? And I think, um, I hope we come to expand the, the definition of what we're calling classic music. Because every, you know, you, you look at the long tradition of Indian classical music as well. Like there's all, all over the world, you know, we look and there's, there's these classic musics. So I guess uh, I, I try to make a distinction between uh, Western art music, you know, uh, and, and, you know, what we, what we commonly call classical music, which is, you know, um, 
the, I guess what would get called the greats. But, uh, and it's beautiful music and we all know this. Uh, and we've all, I think we've all been touched by uh, a lot of composers um, that would fall in this category. But I think, uh, yeah, when, I guess when I speak about post-classical or, or just trying to problematize that term, that's what it looks like. It's just like saying, well, like, you know, rigor looks like a lot of things. And I think that's why a lot of, you know, people have been kept out of these spaces is, is by people saying, well, you know, uh, uh, well, it, it, it's fine to, you know, sing your cultural music and your folk songs, but if you want to come here, you know, there's a certain level of, there's, I've heard the word pedigree over and over again in my life. And I think it's a, it's a real gatekeeping term to say that like, um, you're not, you, you're, you're welcome here, but not for too long. You know, and I think uh, maybe we've, I don't know, maybe this is a common experience among people. I, don't, I know I've felt that in, in, in these higher classical music spaces that, uh, that think a lot of themselves. Thanks for sharing that, Jeremy. I feel like, um, you know, Alana and I were talking about how to, how to foster this conversation and how complex it is at all of our intersections. And I just want to bring us a moment to, to all of the amazing intersections that we cover as, as a group here and hold so much love and gratitude towards these narratives being brought to the forefront. And Jeremy, as, as an artist that really does focus on land ownership, territories, and, and identity within like soil, like ground, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, and geography, I feel like it's so important to acknowledge that there are classical classical music, the classics in, in so many cultures. And it is important to identify the differences in that geography. And to also just take a little like, we see you classical music culture moment and acknowledge how much classical music wants to be held as this luxurious art form that it is. And I'm talking about European, you know, classical music. And, and to have, you know, to hear that that, that space would, would kind of give you, um, you know, a parking, a parking permit to only be here for one hour free parking, you know, and then, you know, it's because, because art cannot be frozen in time. Art evolves for you to say post-classical, whatever that means, you know, we use these, these jumping points to expand in our art. And I, we, we see, we see the rules, you know, that get placed and we, we're keeping an eye on that. And, and you know, well, that's, that's what's beautiful. I think I look at somebody like Nina Simone, who talked about, well, you know, I'm a black classical pianist, you know, uh, I'm not a jazz musician. And I, I, I really like, uh, I thought about this a lot and like, okay, so what does that mean in our context as indigenous people here? What does, what does indigenous classical music even sound like? And then we yeah. start to dream and then that's a kind of futurism that I want to create music into, you know? And uh, just to acknowledge those intersections too, and those uh, uh, part of the thing I want to identify in my work is talking about eldership as well, and like uh, the ones that went before. And I just want to acknowledge uh, Glenn here uh, as as a real elder among us, uh, and somebody who has gone before in a real uh, in a really important way, uh, both musically and from an identity standpoint. And so I just I, I want to send so much love to you. I think in 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 my home territory. Right? You're in Willistogook in New Brunswick? No, I moved to no Nova Scotia. Oh. I'm sitting, I'm sitting on, uh, on Gluskap's territory. <laughs> oh, I love it. I, I would love to hear um, from you, Glenn, about your own journey into, into classical music as it relates to your identity as well, because something that um, Lydia and I struggled with or I think something that I've struggled with mostly in these conversations is um, being mindful of highlighting the identity and that overriding the attention um, to the music. And um, and I say that as a as a an artist in in uh, the nation that we call Canada, because um, I remember someone asking me. I think it was in Jamaica, and they're like, "Why are Canadians so obsessed with identity?" You know, and I don't know if that's a uniquely Canadian preoccupation, but Glenn, you're American born and raised and then came to Canada. And I'd be curious to know um, how your identity impacted your music making uh, in America versus Canada. Did you encounter some of these conflicts uh, only after you came to McGill to study or has 
Like, how has your identity impacted? I haven't experienced conflicts. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> when you're old, you have a whole different kind. I'm learning from you, sir. I'm learning from you. You're redefining things. When I was growing up, classical music, which is for me, was the European tradition of certain composers um, in Europe, primarily, right? Because my father played the, the piano repertoire of that, that was my cradle music, right? But by the time I was 10, I was listening to, no, 12. By the time I was 12, I was listening to Indian music, Indian classical music. I was listening to West African drumming, which is West African classical music. I was listening to, to music from various parts of China, which is their per, you know version of whatever they might call it. I mean, I don't know if it was just the things that were coming out of that part of China at the time, but I was like, I was like entranced. I was listening to Celtic music and stuff that was coming from Ireland and Scotland. You know, I'm, and my grandmother is, is second generation First, first, first Nations. She's, she's a Cherokee, Slaggy as they're called, right? So you put all that together. I was listening to everything. <laughs> I was listening to everything. But the point is that back in those days, right? For me to be a black classical singer was unusual because that's what I was defined as because I went off to, I ended up, because the European classical tradition of, and for me, I couldn't stand opera at all. The reason I couldn't stand opera is because I had to dress up as a female and I wasn't one. So that I, just, I, had one, I wanted nothing to do. And besides it was too grandiose. It was like, give me a break. The only thing I was interested in was the, was the tradition of leader, which is the song repertoire, primarily of the Germanic countries and the song repertoire of the, of the French, French folks, right? And that was, that was my, oh, like, I cannot tell you how profoundly that moved me. But at the same time, I was totally aware that, the, but in, that in those countries, what they called classical music was, was this very small, whatever, because if you listen to the music of the people that say of the 14th century in, in, um, in Germany or in uh, England or any place, it was all infused with stuff that was coming from North Africa, right? It, the, the, the rhythms were coming out of North Africa and, and out of the Arabic countries and they were doing amazing things. The people were dancing like wildly to things that had nothing to do with what those who were getting dressed up in their frills were, were concerned with. So it's like, for me, if you say classical, it has a lot of different meanings. Yeah. It's interesting, you, I mean, you, you talk about growing up on classical Chinese music and um, Celtic music and West African drumming in the same home in what 1950s Philadelphia? Yes. You, I mean, you're talking about that like it's a common experience, but mm-hmm. my under, it's it's not. And so, can you share a bit about how that music came into your life in your home and and um, maybe detail that scene for us to understand how those those influences came came to you? Well, it, it, it's very difficult to to actually talk about how it happened because I don't really remember much ever. That happens when you get to be 77. <laughs> Sorry to inform you, but- But you mentioned that your father was was musical. Was he a professional musician or? No, uh, yeah, he, if he, if he would have wanted to have been, no, he didn't. He didn't ever really want to be a classical um, performer. For him, it was the music of the, of the deepest of his emotions. Um, and those emotions were primarily expressed through Chopin and Beethoven and Bach. And it was like, he spent five hours a day. He was an utterly brilliant pianist. And he's, you know, he just spent five hours a day playing that after he came home from, he was a, he was a teacher and eventually, eventually a principal of a high school, right? And it was a black high school, black, he was teaching black students and whatever. But for some reason or another, that was just, it was just calling to him that music for personal expression. And so because I heard that all the time, it's just, you know, it, it, 
it was it was the foundation of music period for me but for some reason or another you know my parents also loved big band jazz right so they had this huge big band jazz collection which of course i was being exposed to but then i just started going whoa and i i just started listening to everything boogie woogie black stick your backside out and go for it you know all this kind of every kind of music i loved it i was very picky about what specific pieces but in terms of genre there wasn't any genre that i didn't love that's just i don't know i guess i came here to be a this is why glenn is a future person you know <laughs> a mm. person you know because i think this is exactly where music's going a, a de-genrefication of 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 musical experience because i think now it's the we 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 can cast the net really wide on what we're able to hear and listen to and that's just global now you know pretty yeah. much pretty much and increasingly mm. so, you know. it's more of a body experience if you go to the body and trust when it's telling you what what's resonating with you or not then it's just a feeling or a vibe, as we say in in Jamaica. Just it's just a vibes a vibes thing, you know, as opposed to delineating. Um, I, I just want to say one thing more. Mm -hmm. Adija, I now love opera. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, and I was looking at your resume. It was like, go. Go, Khadija, go. Oh, my resume is so not even a thing. Like, it's so lacking in operatic experience. <laughs> That's not the point. That's not the point. You you are a, an, an incredibly brilliant woman, and it shines out so gorgeously. I just was sitting there going, oh, yes, look at this. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, and it, it'll come. It'll, you know, if you want to sing opera, you go for it. You can redefine it however you want. That's the thing. I think even as I'm just like listening and taking in everything that y'all are saying, I I really identified with Glenn how you talked about your father just feeling the emotional expression and being able to find that release in these composers. Because to me, that's always been the thing. Like I talk a lot, but ironically enough, I don't actually the reason that I like music is because I don't have to talk. Like <laughs> I just love uh, the feeling of, and I always talk about this, with like how musical theater, they talk about the rule of, with musical theater, you're talking, you get so excited, you can't talk, you have to sing. And you get so excited, you can't sing anymore, you have to dance. And mm -hmm. so I've always kind of felt this way with, with opera and, and just classical music in general, but especially, yeah, I, I love leader and melody. Those are like, and, and when I was in university, I was like, I'm gonna sing opera. And then after I graduated, it was like, oh, I just wanna do art song, opera. Like, I just like, I just like found this love for art song. And I just think it's so intimate. And so like, there, there are certain things, like if I listen to Froné's A Présent Rêve, there's something about that piece of music that just expresses to me what I want to feel that I can't explain in words. And so that really spoke to me, but as well, just this ideal of, of, I feel like as a society in general, even taking music out of the conversation for a moment, we're really doing this thing where we're not letting these boxes have such high uh, walls. Mm. So like uh, we are still, I think still using typification or like just typing to, to make sense of the world for sure. Because we know if I see something with four legs on a flat surface, it's a stool or a chair. Like we know, like we're, we're still using that kind of way to find meaning, mm -hmm. but it's like we're changing and, and bending those boxes and walls that I feel like are so entrenched in, in, western tradition in colonization in that kind of mindset of like we need everything to be neat and organized and separate and here's this and here's this categorize we know where to put you exactly that's the whole thing it's like it's the whole what are you or what do you do people ask you those questions not because they want to know but because they want to know how they're supposed to make sense of you and how they're supposed to treat you and so with all of us just kind of anarchy a little not even really but just being ourselves and having these different genres come together and allowing them to bleed into each other i don't know there's something really beautiful about that that 
uh, bending of the of the boundaries, so to speak. I'm one curious. The, why, this one of the reasons, the reasons why I just adore your 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 stuff, Jeremy. Sorry. I I I I just adore Jeremy's Jeremy's music for that very reason, Khadija. Because there's I, all this like. What, what? There's just so, like, even just checking out your website and seeing all the different, like, I don't know how to explain it. I just was like, why have I never been able to find, or I guess not find, but taught about artists like you in school, you know? Like, I just recently graduated, and they make it seem like, Jeremy, you can't have a career doing the stuff that you do. Yeah. Like, they make it seem like that, but seeing you, I was just like, well, so what the heck is up with this? Like, I was like, what? Like, there's only one path. There's so many paths. Yes. And what I is, can you, okay, so there, there are a couple of things. I do need you to categorize some things because some things I don't know what you're talking about. What is art, art sound, art music? Oh, yes. <laughs> do either one of you want to take that? Uh, I, I'll, uh, I'll defer, well, I guess. <laughs> It, 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 like classical music, it has another one of these large nets, you know, but uh, I guess a really, a, if I can. How uh, would you describe it in, in, in art school class 101? What's okay, the textbook definition? Uh, <laughs> correct me if, if this doesn't feel true to anybody, but I might say that it is a, a, a connection of word and voice or sound and word in uh, a storytelling format that is, um, uh, as, as, was, as was pointed out earlier, intimate, you know, an intimate storytelling format um, between um, an ensemble, like a small ensemble of musicians, um, often just a, a singer and an instrumentalist or sometimes a little uh, ensemble, but it really is, is, is the, one of the most intimate forms of song other than an acapella, you know, vocal uh, or just one person playing an instrument or something. Um, it is, I think, one of the most vocally vulnerable places to be, right? Mm. Um, and does yeah. that oh, ability, I, I'm curious to know what the, the essence of it is that resonates with you, Khadija, when, when we're hearing the, when I hear the word intimate and vulnerable, I think of a quiet music, I think of a small sound, I think of the musicians being close together and almost insular, but vulnerability can also be big and full voiced. So what is, what is some of the, the feelings or what are the characteristics of, of art music? Because, and I'm curious about this as well, because if we are talking about classical music and, um, deconstructing deconstructing and then reconstructing a new understanding of this music that we take for granted i'm very curious about this this new sect of classical music that i've never heard of before it's five our song is yeah our song is pretty old um but uh like the way i make sense of it to people sometimes is like okay you know how in musicals people will take certain songs out of context of a musical and sing them. In opera, you can do that. And those songs would be called arias, operatic arias. Like you take a song like everybody knows, oh mio babino caro, mi piaceva. Like that song is an aria because it's from an opera that somebody has taken that song out of context. With art song, think about how people just write music nowadays, singer songwriters. That's kind of art song. And then you have like, I wouldn't say albums, but you have song cycles where it's multiple songs and those would maybe be like mini EPs or something. That's not the best way to describe, but do you know what I mean? Like it's, um, so like it, I'll use a set that I did as an example because the very first piece that I sung was Der Erdkönig and that is a German art song. Oh God, it was, it was kind of, it was, there was a lot happening there. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, there's a but lot like, happening there. But... It, it was fun, it was fun. It was, mm, but it was fun. I just was like, let's just try it. Let's just do this. This is wild. <laughs> um, as what is his name? Uh, Randy from American Idol was saying, it was a bit pitchy, but it was fine. It was fine. <laughs> <laughs> You know? I love these classical music inside jokes, like, oh, the ishkid, ishkid, ishkid. 
yes but no, we're talking that about. that piece of music is just very a lot especially like not even just for the singer but for the pianist because you're playing these octaves and you're supposed to mimic a horse so the way the music is very rushed in the beginning, you're yeah. like, and that's 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 something that you can do an art song that like you can kind of do an opera for sure, but like an art song, you just see it more up close. And a lot of times, especially with vocal stuff, it's voice and piano, or it can be a smaller chamber group as well. You can do voice and uh, violin or voice and cello, um, and especially American and Canadian, there's so much brilliant, like I, a black American art song is like one of my favorite things in the world. It's so like, there's just so much to choose from. There's, the, and as Jeremy was saying, there's this connection of poetry as well. Like a lot of art song, especially when you look at like German art song and stuff is about connecting famous German poets with these composers and just, just pairing the two and seeing what kind of music you can make from that. Um, sorry, I don't know if I answered your question. I'm still kind of like trying answering to make sense. It and you're inspiring more new questions. Um, I'm going to turn to to Glenn and Jeremy and, and bring you into the conversation in just a minute. But I, I when you said Black American art song, I felt my ears go, huh? <laughs> Mind you too. You know, <laughs> especially when we're thinking about poetry with sound, I'm curious to know about the lyricism and what what stories are be, being told in and maybe introduce some of your favorites if you can recall oh gosh so it's very interesting to me like american art song in general i think is quite beautiful because i just think there's a different you can see the influence of black american music in it even if the composers are white there's a bit of that in there no matter what i think of someone like john musto uh and Langston Hughes is someone that a lot of people in America will use his poetry in their art song. Like you will find that so much because it's wow. Langston Hughes, you know, um, there's one called Litany and the very beginning, it's very beautiful. Oh, it's a long intro, but it's so pretty. And the first line is gather up, gather up in the arms of your pity. And just like the way, Ooh, oh no, y'all need to listen to that. John Booth. Um, but there, there are so many people, like another, I guess like a white composer would be Jake Hagee. He's one that's very popular that a lot of people really like. Um, but for Black American art song, there, are, Robert Owens is one that I, I really admire. Um, he passed away a few years ago, but people like him, people like George Walker, people like Florence Price, um, there, there are honestly so, so, so many, and people don't, know that like they don't know that black americans as well were creating art song we're creating these pieces of music like people just think that it's they don't really if people think it's hard to see a black classical singer they especially can't wrap their minds around a black <laughs> classical composer classical i'll put in quotes <laughs> composer um but yeah, I, I can share a list and stuff like that after there's a great instagram called perfect day music competition and they did one recently where it was just all about either black poets or black composers and you just could check out like the singers all performed all of these works they gave you little bios on the on the composers as well and it's just like I don't I don't know how to explain it I feel like I'm 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 really uh not you're being doing very an articulate. excellent job you're doing an excellent <laughs> job and, and like you said sometimes words aren't enough but just the excitement that is 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 um, emitting from your from your person is is communicating um, the bright possibilities of a new conception or understanding or um, output from from classical from classical music and that's you know more than we could have hoped for from from this conversation. I mean, just seeing. I feel like this conversation could have consisted of. Glenn complimenting Khadija and Jeremy and then seeing you, you two beam. I feel like those moments, <laughs> seeing that connection <laughs> says so much about, and see, I, Khadija, if we can collaborate on some kind of um, playlist that we oh, can yes. give to That's this people, or we can even follow mm -hmm. up with some yeah. of these names and Luca who's part of the Susu crew is in the chat section so we'll make sure that um, he's getting these links and people can follow their 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 curiosities. I don't want to belabor um, the point of of struggle in 
um, the intersections of, of our different identities within the classical music world. But um, Lydia is always inspiring uh, vulnerability. So I'm gonna follow her lead <laughs> with this. And I, I would like to hear about, you know, even, even if, if you're not putting in context of I'm black and queer, indigenous and queer and went into classical music training, but um, even as people who are like, oh, I like pop music and Celtic music and Chinese classical music. And I took those influences, went into an institution that has a pretty set curriculum. I'd be curious to know what your experiences were like. You know, Glenn, you said there weren't any conflicts, but those music, the musical influences that you listed seem kind of incongruous with what you'd expect to learn in a formal academic institution teaching classical music. So can you each maybe share, um, yeah, any moments that stick out from your, from your training that shaped your understanding of yourself or of classical music? What was, what was it like to train as classical musicians? Who do you want to start? Um, let's start with Jeremy. Haven't heard from, oh, oh, Jer, Jer's passing it on. Okay, let's start with Glenn. Let's start with Glenn and we'll all, we'll all beam and then we'll, we'll go around. No, I had very unusual experiences my whole life around all of it. Um, I ended up uh, training with, uh, at the age of, at the age of, uh, 18, 17 actually, I began to work with a gentleman who was Maureen Forrester's teacher, okay? Yeah, so Maureen used to come, and she'd be coming out of, her, of her, her, her studies with him, her lesson, and I'd be going in the door, and I knew who she was, and was like, wow, wow, <laughs> it's like, whoa. Anyway, this, this, this gentleman, he was, an, he was uh, beyond the pale. Uh, he was amazing. And he understood how much I loved leader. And he was himself a leader singer and uh, went on to become a very, very famous leader singer after I was no longer studying with him. But he was already, he had already, he had run from the Nazis and, and had come to Canada. But anyway, um, so my experience with, with him was absolutely extraordinary. Um, and, uh, and then uh, a few years later, I ended up studying with a woman named Eleanor Stieber, who was the uh, um, Mozart specialist at the Metropolitan Opera. And um, she was as well, extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. Um, but both of them, realized that there was something about me that didn't quite fit classical music. <laughs> they both realized, especially, especially Eleanor Stever, she just, she would, sometimes she would be looking at me, you know, she was like teaching me for free, right? And I, she, sometimes she would just look at me, she'd just look at me and she, in her, I could see in her eyes going, this person doesn't fit what, it, what will be needed at the Metropolitan Opera, right? And I just, or any opera for that matter, um, and it wasn't very long. I, I, it, was, it was actually during my studies with her that I suddenly went, no, no, I cannot sing leader any, I can't sing leader. I love leader. And I'll, I'm gonna tell you my, my definition of leader in a minute, but remind me to come back to that. But I can't do this. I need to, I need to be expressing the music of my teenagehood and all of the different influences that I was exposed to. And I, which means that I've got to start writing the music myself, right? So I just went out and, and you know, bought a guitar and started retuning it as though it was a piano because I didn't really know how to play the piano really well at all because my father was so good. It was too much for me to keep up with him. It was like the bar was too high, right? It was like, oh, no, can't compete with daddy. So we'll, you know, <laughs> never mind. We'll go get a guitar, try to make it sound like a piano. But uh, I want to come back to the, 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 the concept of, of leader, which is something that I understood, which is that, so you're putting together words to the music, 
but in, in the classical tradition, if you want to experience, if you want to talk about difficulty or sorrow or whatever that, you know, usually heavy, usually heavy emotion, and you're talking a whole orchestra and sometimes uh, maybe a quartet or something like that, you've got 15 minutes to do it. <laughs> you can go on and on and on for 15 minutes of, <laughs> well, leader is the short version of it. <laughs> but you also can experience happiness because the songs are not all like eh, wrenching. Some of them are absolutely joyous, and, but you only have five minutes to do it in, or six minutes to do it. In. And that's how I think of it. Yeah. I hope I answered your, your question. You did. You did. I wanted to, um, before we go on to the others, you talked about um, your instructor looking at you and thinking, yeah, not going to fit. What yeah. was the fit? What were you expected to fit into? Yeah. Okay. I was expected to be wearing um, uh, frou-frou costumes um, and dying every other second because back in those days, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I look, gosh, okay. you can't be a, you can't be a feminine singer and not die on stage. You just have <laughs> to die. On stage. You had to die for sure because after all, women could never be um, uh, the winners. <laughs> In anything right no you're always sacrificing yourself jumping off the parapet you know whatever right it's like well first of all that didn't appeal to me in the slightest i grew up with women who were incredibly strong right the men were incredibly gentle and protective but gentle and the women were courageous and and warriors right so i was like i didn't get you know like hmm, that doesn't mean anything right what in the heck is that right but then in addition to that I wasn't a female in the first place. And I knew that from the time I was three. So like, what, what, what was I supposed to do with opera, right? And I knew she was picking up on that. That's why she was looking at me like that. It's like, no, I cannot see this person getting dressed up in a do 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 and you know, no, this is not gonna work. This is, I'm not getting feminine vibes from this, this person. I knew she was, right? And I just went, yeah, you're right. You're not getting it at all. <laughs> and now I'm exiting stage right at 45 miles an hour. <laughs> Were there any moments in your training that did resonate with you that 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 did fit? Oh yeah. Oh, the music all fit in terms of the leader all fit. I just loved it. It's just that I just couldn't I felt like I had done that in a previous lifetime and that's why I knew it so well and but it, it was not meant for this lifetime to it, to be exclusively expressing something that was specifically of the 18th and 19th centuries and a bit in the 20th century. You know, they're just in, in, a, in, in one particular portion of one particular aspect of, the, of a society in, in Europe. It just didn't work for me. And how lucky are we that we get your music? <laughs> that well, it didn't work. For me, I feel, you know, I'm, you know, I won't get into this, you know. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. Yeah. And it, I think that's part of what's so beautiful about this conversation is understanding, um, is getting to hear your full story, you know, and, and, and hearing about how um, when, when you were identified as not fitting, that's one thing, but for you to know within yourself that it wasn't a right fit for you and you choosing to find a new path, you know, I feel like um, that's part of contributing to a new expression of, of classical music um, is that you don't have to necessarily be in the institution is what I'm getting from your story to be a classical musician. Um, and so I'm curious to hear from Jeremy and Khadija as well, because there's this time that uh, if, we're, if we're thinking about it chronologically, so Glenn is at McGill and it's just like, e, you know what? I don't want to die a million times within a 15 minute song. I'm going to leave and play my guitar and put out these records, be on Mr. Dress Up. And as this is happening, Khadija and Jeremy are born and they're hearing their own influences and starting to, you know, think about musical theater and move into classical music training. And Glenn's percolating here and that energy is going out. I'm just, I like thinking about like your spirits all like meeting yeah. and coming to this moment. <laughs> And so I would love for Jeremy and Khadija, 
Whoever wants to go first, Jeremy, I'll let you decide who goes first. Jeremy, after you. <laughs> Hear about your own entry points into um, classical music. Uh, maybe some of your earlier influences before you studied it formally. Um, and well, let's start from there. What were some of your earlier influences and what introduced you to classical music as a, as a possibility? Okay, yeah. Um, I knew nothing about classical music or quite early in my life at all. Uh, I, I was kind of a late adopter, I guess. Um, my brother was a classical pianist. And so growing up, we didn't really have money, but we were donated a, a piano. And so there was a piano in the home and I'm so fortunate for that. Um, so, but he was also very proprietary about who got to play his piano. <laughs> so I, uh, I, I did a lot of watching uh, as a child, um, you know, my older brothers, cause I'm the youngest of four. And um, yeah, so that's all I knew about classical music was him playing the piano, kind of similar to, to, to Glenn's experience in a way uh, with his father, you know, sort of sitting at the feet and, and dreaming about like, well, maybe one day, you know, I'll get to play music like that. Um, but yeah, I, and then and sometimes when he would go away, I would, I would sit at the piano and just kind of teach myself chords and think about sound and um, but not very trained in a way. And I never was, like I never trained as a pianist at all. Uh, I very much um, used it as a means to, to accompany the voice, you know, and to sing in that way. Um, and then it kind of grew from there. Um, but one thing I want to pick up on that, 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 that Glenn was saying earlier too was the, and, and it kind of relates to, to, to a, 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 a somebody who influences me a lot in my thinking, who's Buffy St. Marie. And she says, you know, if you don't see, um, if what you want is not on the menu, you know, go into the kitchen, cook it up and show them how good it tastes. Uh, and this like, is like, <laughs> for me, it's, the, it's just the perfect succinct reason um, and kind of what I take forward as a creation philosophy. Um, you know, because it's, 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 it's an active sense of going out there and, 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 and knowing what you offer is, is, is going to be um, of value, you know, and that's a, even that as a, in these bodies is a radical statement, you know, today. And I think uh, we're all living proof that we can come through these institutions and still be ourselves and still tell our stories in our terms. And so, you know, I think for me, upon entering the sort of what came, what I came to know as classical music was through the theater, you know, um, uh, and I wanted to go deeper. Like I asked, you know, my theater teachers, okay, how do I take this more and more deeper? Whether it's like, do you know about opera? <laughs> I said, no, no, I don't know anything about that. So in, uh, as high school came to close, I, I was, you know, I wasn't really good at math or science or, uh, you know, uh, geography or much, but music, it really, it really, really became my, uh, what I was really passionate about, you know, and, and just at that time too, I was also, you know, cause my, my mother was making sure that we were connected to who we were as indigenous people. And so she was working in the community and introduced me to this elder named Maggie Paul, um, who really, uh, I mean, she changed my life, you know, getting to work with her. She set me on a path to um, understand that, you know, every, every single people in the world has musics, you know, and, and it's um, the most beautiful thing that we get to swap them and share them and be at the intersections of them and, and you know, uh, create across them and, and tell stories between them. And I think so, I was really influenced. So before I even got into classical music, I was being tutored by this woman to, you know, understand music in a philosophically different way. Then when I got to classical music school, it was like, oh, here's a here's a, a way of thinking about music that's based in competition and, and elitism and in um, sort of us versus them and telling quite fatalistic stories, quite misogynistic stories, quite, you know, stories that were just not kind of, kind of seemed really bizarre to me. Like, why are we venerating these, these, uh, these things? And so right away, like my first year, I remember the first year or two of, 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 of school um, was really, really difficult just because I was, there was, you know, 
and that was my first time being away from the territory too. And then at this time too, there was a there was a uprising among the Mi'kmaq at El Cibokto. And there was and there was a bunch of our people, the the Wolusta, because we're their neighbors. And so we went there. And so my uncle is you know getting arrested. And you know, I have to watch this on uh, you know social media because I can't go home. I'm at school and I'm like, you know, and like looking around at all this like colonial, you know, dressing that I have to contend with on a daily basis. And it's like, okay. And and then it kind of just snapped one day and I said, and it was probably after hearing that Buffy quote, to be honest where it was like, okay, you just gotta, I don't see what is out there, which is an authentic representation of indigenous stories um, through art music. Um, and I want that, I want that. And so um, what do I have to do to get it? Okay, do I have to learn how to play the piano? Okay, I'll do that. What well, do I have to, do I have to compose and, and get, gather all these musicians? And well, I ended up, and then, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I feel like I'm really going- No, up. tell us, what's the journey? Go for it, go for it. For it. I'm, I'll, okay, I'll try to wrap it up. But you know, I, I think for me, like classical music, um, the, the constricting nature of those institutions that teach us classical music was the pressure that created the, the, the ability for me to go out and you know, start working with uh, our song carriers, to start to you know, learn about the wax cylinder collections that were in the museums and how the, the repatriation of, these, uh, of our heritage uh, and how that's a really, really timely thing that we gotta start thinking about and start doing and, and how important our language is and how we have to uh, pass this forward all the time. So, yeah, all of these kind of messages were colliding at that same time, you know, when I was like, it was like, I was maybe 21 or something. I was like, oh, not too much. And and, and I just decided, you know, I, I just got to go to the museum and do that research and then and, and write something that makes sense to my people, because none of this, none of this makes sense to my people. <laughs> you know, I go home, I can't tell them what, what, you know, the stuff I've been, you know, dealing with at school, because like, it, they have no reference point for any of it. So I want to tell our story. I want to be in our language. I want to tell our stories, and um, yeah, I'm grateful for all those like really weird experiences in classical music settings and and in school and and out of school. And um, now that I'm entering those spaces with my project, which is very like in yeah. the middle space of what classical music and and folk indigenous tradition look like. Um, there's a grind there too, you know, and there's there can often be some uh, some side glances or some things said that uh, you know are um, you know are not so hard in the moment, but often accumulate after a while. And you know, I, I've been very very fortunate to have this time to like, okay, that was a really intense couple of years. Now let's uh, now let's see what's next because I think um, now that people are listening and now that these institutions have at least in a surface level kind of opened the door to us and said, hey, come tell your stories with us. Mm -hmm. I, I try not to be cynical too much. And I hope that, uh, that you know, they, they, they mean it and that um, that door will stay open and, and that we can then hold that door open for, for our cousins and, 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 and the people that uh, we, we think should have the microphone right now. Cause I think, and that's where these like indigenous and black solidarities I think are really, really important. And, and you know, like, yeah, so uh, anyway. I'll, uh, I'll, maybe, I'll maybe set it down there because um, I could, yeah, there's so much to talk about here. You know, there's, there's so many intersections of identity and class. And, you know, I think, of course, we can only scratch the surface. And there's so much just within these uh, five little squares, so much. Uh, <laughs> but there are, there are very grounded um, connections in your human experience as well. We could talk about intersections of queerness and, and Black and Indigenous identity and all these um, terms and socially constructed understandings of who we are. But when you're talking, Jeremy, the link that I'm hearing between you and Glenn was hearing how much your sense of self was reinforced within your home, within your own family, how hearing, um, well, in Glenn's case, that instructor that looked and, and understood that Glenn didn't necessarily fit or you hearing a quote from Buffy 
someone who gave you permission to be yourself, you know? So even if you don't under, I don't know what the word repatriation means. I'm going to Google it after so that I fully understand. Me too. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I understand what it feels like when somebody looks at you and says, you can do it. Try, you know, you just need permission to try and see what can happen. And that's the only way that a possibility has a chance of becoming a reality. And that is a, a, a common human experience um, that I think is beautiful. And unfortunately, I know that there was some inner conflict that happens with that, you know, in trying something new, you have to be the one to make the mistake, learn from it, feel the impacts of that, relay all the lessons from those, you know, relay all the knowledge from those lessons. That's a heavy thing to carry, especially when you consider most people are starting university in this training at 18, 19, 21, when you're figuring out, figuring out who you are. So yeah. I think, you know, as I'm hearing you all speak, I am hearing um, uh, the conversation that Lydia was encouraging us to have is, is highlighting the importance of the intersections because when we strip those intersections of some of the heady understandings of that of what that means, there's some important human heart and body understanding, some real feelings um, that I feel like we need to acknowledge you and validate your existence. We it's, need it. It's so transformative. Especially in this space. I mean, like, look at these screens, y'all. We, we need the love, we need the support, we need the validation towards continuing to move forward because it takes a lot. It takes a lot mm -hmm. to get out of bed in the morning. It takes a lot to answer those emails that trigger us, answer those questions that trigger us. And so I just want to throw that support your way, Jeremy. And thank you for sharing that story. Oh, yeah. And I think that's something that you touched on, uh, like the continuance is really important, right? So like uh, we have like these multiple generations sort of lifting each other up at once, you know, um, and teaching each other too. And I think that's what something that 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 Glenn, I know you've highlighted in in in, in what I've heard you say is, is that you know you learn from the young people too. And I think that's what uh, when I talk to my elders in my community as well, it's it, this is what they highlight as well. It's you know. Um, it's that reciprocal uh, wheel of, 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 of learning each other uh, and to know ourselves. And I think that's, 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 we've been very fortunate to be grounded in that way. And, and then we can be a light for other people as well. And, and that's, that's, that, that's that lifting others up, you know, because there's gonna be another generation that you know, is not maybe necessarily grappling for the same kinds of space to be heard that we had to, or that, you know, that, uh, that, you know, uh, our forebearers like Buffy or Glenn had to, um, but uh, they'll have different challenges too. They'll have, they'll have other, they'll have other things that, that, that we'll learn too. Um, anyway, I just wanted, I wanted to talk about continuance there. And then I really want to hear Khadija's story. Yes. Yes. Awesome. My background, my parents were immigrants to America. They're West African Muslim families from the Gambia, a very tiny country in West Africa. People know about Senegal. Gambia is inside of it. So uh, we have a lot of the same customs and things, but colonization. French took them. The English took us. Here we are. And it's almost the G Gambia is like, yeah, in, it's literally within Seneca, within inside. Seneca. It's like, it's like as if Manitoba was its own country yeah. surrounded by. Yeah. Like Senegal's here and the Gambia is like the strip inside. <laughs> Very small. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't grow up with music. So like I grew up hearing Malak's music, which is like traditional Senegalese, West African music. Um, at parties and weddings and gintes, it was a lot of, that's what we called like uh, naming ceremonies and hails and stuff like that. It's a lot of drumming and things like that. So I grew up hearing that stuff. But uh, when my parents moved over, you know, they didn't have a lot of money. So my dad was in school, my mom was working, my aunt was working, I had three parents growing up. And so for me, I just always, uh, I ended up being in choirs almost on accident. Like it was just because it was something for me to do after school. And so uh, I didn't actually even realize that I liked music 
until I moved to Canada and I didn't have choir that I could sing in and I realized how much I missed it. And so I would print out lyric sheets every day. Oh, my dad was so mad. Like, he was like, why? Like, my, and my the funny thing is, as well, is that my dad, when I was growing up, my dad did not, my dad still doesn't really listen to music. Uh, he did not like music. And the irony of that, that I think is, because uh, in Islam, they would never call it singing. It's haram to call it that. But there are certain melismas that you use when you're reciting the Quran. And my sister had told me that she heard my dad's and it just sounded like the most beautiful thing she'd ever heard. And I was like, how ironic that I probably got my singing ability from my dad who doesn't think he sings or doesn't wow. like me. Like, I just thought it was kind of like, I've always thought about that. He's since come around, but when I was going to school, it was very hard to get him on board. Both of my parents, like they just were like, I don't get it. I would have performances and they wouldn't come I'd be like the last one picked up from things like even if I had a solo, like I just didn't have the support. Uh, and I, to the point where one time my choir teacher in high school, cause I ended up going to a fine arts high school was like to my mother, Hey, your daughter can actually like sing. And I think you should, I don't know. It was like something out of some after school movie special or something. Um, but after that, my mom started to support a bit more and she got me my first voice lesson. And I thought that I was going to be writing my own music and singing jazz. Like I was like, that's my thing. Like, uh, Lydia Meg Contini and I were in high school together. We were in vocal jazz together. Um, the first time I ever heard Meg sing, I was like, why am I here? <laughs> I was like, I should just She's wrap good. it up. It's time to go. Um, She's good. You're right. But yeah, I had a voice teacher and she played me Jesse Norman, who was a famous opera singer. And I had never, I, I looked at this woman and I was like, black people sing opera. Like, I was so confused. I was like, what is this? And she was like, you should listen to her. And the first song I ever heard was her singing Mon Cousse à Tavois, which is this like seduction aria. And Jesse Norman has this huge hair. This woman is conducting it and she's wearing this giant robe and she's just like, her mouth is massive. And she's just like giving you this song and her voice is so rich. And is I was like- the woman oh. with the very full eyes? She's like, I don't know. She is, she has very expressive eyes. Yes. Okay. Like she's, she's an expressive or she was rest in peace, an expressive performer. Um, but yeah, when I saw that, it kind of was like, Oh, but I still, I'm the kind of person that when I was younger, it took a few drills, like with Glenn saying, you know, a teacher looked at me and was like, mm. and with Jeremy being like, yeah, you know, I heard this quote and it really spoke to me for me. I had to get that hammered into me a few times. Cause I was determined to fit in. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I was like, I can be normal. I can fit in. Like I, I'm not going to stand out. It's fine. And I remember one of my voice teachers kind of being like, I don't think you have a problem with standing out. Like they kind of tried to point it out to me. And I was like, no, 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 I can fit in. I I'm fine. Like I'm here. I can do this. Um, mm -hmm. So I did classical music lessons kind of on and off, but I wasn't committed to them. And then when I was 22, I was doing sociology English and decided I missed music. Like I'd taken a break from singing and was like, okay, I'm going to try it again. So I auditioned and I had auditioned for jazz programs and like one classical one thinking I wouldn't get into that one. And that was the only one I got into. So wow. when I came into the program, I was like, okay, this is what I'm supposed to be doing for the next little while. I was 24 coming into it and it was a fun time. I, when the first year I was just kind of seeing what it was like. I was like, let's just feel this out, you know? But as it got on, I started to notice, and especially when I started doing therapy, I started doing therapy in third year university. I started to look around and I was like, there are no black people around here. Huh? Not even the teachers. Huh? Not even the clinic. What's happening here? You know, like it was very unsettling to me. And in second year, when I was talking to a friend about it, I just broke down and I didn't even realize how upset I was because I was the only black female singer across all these degree programs. There were like wow. a couple of black guys, like one in the masters, I think one in fourth year and one in third year, but it was just me. Yeah. And I was just so, I felt so alone. And I didn't realize how alone I felt until I was talking to my friend about it. And, you know, I had moved to Toronto and when I had lived in Calgary, ironically enough, I had, had more black friends and mostly black and like Filipinx friends. Those were like the groups of friends that I had. When I moved to Toronto, it was mostly white people. And so I just, continue to feel more isolated. Thankfully I had white friends that I could say that to, but you know, uh, so I decided, okay, I'm gonna do something about this. And they were very supportive. And we went and talked to the voice, the head of the voice department. And we were like, you don't have black people here. We need to figure something out. 
Like we wow. need to fix this. While you so, were in the program, you yeah, went for it. Year. Yeah. And God I bless wouldn't have you. done that. We yeah. talk about going to school when you're 18. I wouldn't have done that if I went to school when I was 18. Yeah. And I was 24 and I still had a lot to learn, but yes. I was six years older than most of the people my age, most people yeah. my grade. So speaking to her, she was more receptive about it. And then the following year, wow. they bring Jesse Norman to the school. And I was like, excuse me? I didn't. <laughs> okay, fine. Who's, who's like, y'all wanted to prove me wrong. Who's Jesse Norman and what about them? Oh, weren't this she is reverence. a famous soprano. She grew up in Georgia, like myself. And she, she, I think she went to Howard University, a historically black college, and studied voice. But she's just one of those people that, like, everybody in the classical music world just knows who she is. Like, she's just, uh, she's just a pillar. And <laughs> when she speaks, even in real life, oh, she's like, hi, yeah. <laughs> Like it's very operatic. You do know, that. That's, that's you. You do that's that. The best way to yes, describe like, you are that. <laughs> but you you can tell she's a singer and she's just so uh oh, there's just something about I cried. It was beautiful. But um anyway, sorry, this is so long. Sorry. Uh not at all. But I in think... the oh sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I don't wanna I don't wanna disrupt the flow. <laughs> I was just gonna say in, in all of this though, um to me, I feel like as I was in university and stuff and going to therapy, my therapist had to kind of look me in the face and be like, okay, has anything in your life ever gone on the straight and narrow path? Like based off what I know about you and what you've said about you. And I was like, what do you mean? And she was just like, you know, like, do you think you're, you, you want these people to accept you? you want to get these master classes, you want to get into these young artist programs, which is what singers do when they graduate from a university and a master's program and all that. Or you want to go to school and keep studying. You want, you, you complain about the fact that you feel like none of these teachers besides your private voice teacher, it feels like they're trying to figure you out. That's what I always felt. Like that teacher looking at you like this, I always felt like they were trying to figure out what to do with me. Uh, Cause I was an older student and I had a sizable instrument, but I also don't think my voice is that big. Like it was just this whole thing of like all these things that they couldn't figure out. And like, I love opera, but I don't like dying all the time. So like my personality is just so different from like a typical soprano. Oh, what was me, Angelo, please. Like, you know, it's just, that's not my personality. So it was just like, there were so many like contradictions and I was trying to like force myself into this. I was like, no. I'm committed. I will be a famous wow. opera singer. I can do it. And it just was like, I, I don't know. I, it was after my therapist had said that it took a while. Like I'm a person that hears something and it takes me a while to process it. So I hear that and I started to kind of realize, and then I graduated during a global pandemic or sorry, a global panorama. And like, <laughs> <laughs> we're not calling it that anymore. We're just, you know, and all of a sudden, all of these conversations started happening around race and I was just like and classical music started talking about it and there was like this weird lane that I could all of a sudden just like drive through and all I did was talk too much on the internet like I literally just said I posted a video just dragging my school because I was like listen I've been talking to y'all about this forever now you want to listen and then it just kind of snowballed from there but that was like the first act of me giving myself permission to say what I wanted to say and have other people hear it. Like I, I, I would always tell my friends it, but I would never be super vocal about it because I just, I was, I was very insecure thinking nobody wants to hear what I have to say. Nobody wants to see someone who looks like me say the things that I'm saying. Like nobody cares. Like mm -hmm. I, I, I really believe that. Um, and so in the last year of, of saying these things more, and I get emotional when I think about it because I, I feel happy that I'm at this place now because it took a while, but I also kind of, of look at the four years that I was in school or all of the training with classical music. And it saddens me because I just can feel how silenced I felt and not even just in terms of speaking, but I was always a very creative person. When I was in high school and we had to do 
presentations in English class, I would write raps for everyone and be like, okay, this is the Canterbury Tales, but we're going to rap it. Here's your line. Here's yours. I'm going to direct you. This is like, I was always that kind of person. Yeah. If the teacher was like, okay, present this project. I'd be like, I want to do a spoken word at the beginning and I want the lights off. And then I want you to turn them on when I speak at this part. Like I was just that kind of person. <laughs> and, but when I was in this music institution, I couldn't do that. It was just regurgitating all the stuff. And they ask you over and over again, what do you have to say? What do you have to say? You say it and they're like, don't say that shit. And you're like, okay, so, or don't say it like that, say it like this. Yeah. It's already, Schubert's been interpreted this way. So this is how we sing Schubert. We don't do it any other way. Wow. And it just, it just, I didn't realize until I graduated how I just literally felt like I, I was so creatively and emotionally and mentally just stifled. Like, it just was so like, what? Like, how did I do that for four years? How? So needless to say, I, uh, I've graduated now. We're in a much better place. I'm still seeing my therapist weekly, you know? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I that was such a journey. <laughs> But I feel like everyone's story kind of had that, you know, and that that's why we're here today and we can share in the ways that we can. And I, and I, I think, I know, I, I hope that we can look back in some ways in all of our lives and just thank whoever for going through those times because it made us who we are, even though it's really hard and isolating, you know, like mm -hmm. thank, thank you for getting through that to all of you. Thank you all for getting through the times that you did because now you can bring the art that you do to someone like me and 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 I can feel that journey through it, you know? Yeah. Definitely, wow. definitely. And whenever I hear um as I was listening to you Khadija and reflecting on, you know, the connection between all of your experiences, um it's sad to me that on top of having to learn the music which does take a huge amount of work to be able to learn the music, to play it with feeling, to be able to think new ideas, but then have it compounded by these restrictions or misunderstandings of who you are and then the work you have to do to break free of that. You know, it just, it, what I'm saying is every, you know, anybody whose uh, identity sits at the intersection of, of all our different, um, uh, how do I talk about us as humans? <laughs> Our traits, <laughs> you know, how we're categorized. Um, understands, like we're preaching to the choir essentially, but I just always feel that it's important to bring it back to a core human experience of the importance of having someone come to your school that looks like you, that counters every, every other message that says that you're different or you don't exist or you're an anomaly. It's like, like actually I'm, normal based on my experience and my experience is just as valid you know and just having how important representation is but hearing you detail all your life experiences again takes the idea of representation out of the head as you know this um cerebral concept and really anchors it into helps us understand what that looks like what that feels like practicing representation, practicing resilience and how that how that shows up in our practice. But you know what also makes me happy is just how much laughing we did today and the head nodding and the smiling and hearing your music. You know, going back to the top of the, the conversation, we wanted to think about classical music um, in a way that conceptualizes classical music uh, that we think we know but then also introducing classical music that we didn't know exists or new perceptions in, in classical music. But I didn't want to do it in a way that was asking you to recall your pain for our learning. I didn't want you to recall your struggle. I just wanted to get a realistic sense of what was the life journey that led to this beautiful music that truly resonates with our hearts and our spirits and our minds. And I hope that um, that you really feel just how true the excitement is that people have for your music, you know, and, and, and for you to feel like maybe that, that, that work was, was worth it. Um, 
And yeah, I think, you know, bringing it again to the music, hearing in all of your voices, um, having heard all of you live, something that resonates with me is this, this term that um, Leslie Feist introduced me to when I was asking her, you know, what is it about the voice? What do you look for in a voice that you admire or that you enjoy or that speaks to you? And she introduced me to the, the concept of duende, you know, and duende is, you know, if you hear a flamenco singer and you hear their voice ring and they're, they're communicating their pain to you and you may not know what their life story is or the details of it, but you feel it in that voice, that is duende, what I call like the realness. And all of you, there's in your tremolo, your vibrato, there's just this such um, tenderness and power in it. And you have that duende and hearing your life story, um, your music makes so much more sense to me because y'all have lived through some real shit. And so no wonder you're making some real shit and it's just beautiful. It's beautiful. Like Lydia, I don't know what it is. I don't really have a point. I'm just, you know, I'm just walking through my feelings, but I think I'm being so verbose because I'm, I, there's, there's no way for me to articulate in words what it feels like when someone resonates with you on an energetic level, you know, and for all the bullshit the institution instills in music, um, for it also gave us these um, chord progressions and these different uh, melodies that help us translate what we can articulate in words into feeling. You, you know, so I don't know, y'all made it. Congratulations. Is that the point? Sure, we'll go with that. <laughs> yeah. Yay, music! Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Running video. Bonjour tout le monde. Chris Allen. Hi everyone. Um, in today we speak with AJ Plug and Naga Duje on a good cook. Mobinaki cook Naga Bengiska, Kehuda, Susu, Wavewe. And Naga Kmilan Kmilania. Mehe Ventuagno Kanawe Bilawe Naga Cabaret. So I just said, uh, My name is Jeremy Dutcher. I'm very happy to be here with you. Thank you to Susu for inviting me here. I'm going to share with you uh, an old song, a new song, and uh, a cover. So thank you. <laughs>